Hang on, I gotta find out what I'm saying. There we go. Okay, so we're going to open up with uh, the third century uh, church history here with with origin and with what took place there and the chief attack that was against the Christians and against the churches uh, in that time period in the third century. And the attack kind of changed a little bit. So open your Bibles up again to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which, hath been, which, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Those will be the three verses that you'll memorize here this week. Now, uh, one of the questions that you will be asked uh, to remember is, who is that chief heretic? Who is the chief creep, so to speak, that crept in to the church in uh, to the churches in the first century or in the third century and had such an effect on them? And his name is Origen. Now, uh, James Beller says this. He says Satan's device in the first century was to kill the Christians. His device in the second century was to destroy the scriptures. The Bible bears testimony and history reveals that Satan could accomplish neither. The more the Christians were persecuted, the more they increased. And the more the scriptures were burned, the more they were copied. This brings us to the satanic device for the third century. Change the scriptures. This has become the adversary's most effective device. So he figured out, Satan figured out, well, I can't destroy the Bible. So I'll just create counterfeit ones. Right. I'll just I'll just create a bunch of counterfeit ones and his chief creep that he used, his chief devil in the flesh, so to speak, was origin. He was a very wicked man. I can't explain to you enough how much damage this man caused and how much he has continued to cause and how Satan used his writings. Well, they started a school which we talked about. A little bit in the second century. Actually, he took over a school uh, at Alexandria, and his name was Origen. Despite the warning of the Apostle Paul, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. A group of worldly Christian scholars sought out the ideas of the Greeks at the most prestigious college in all the world at the time, the college at Alexandria, Egypt. So picture it's not much different than the universities that you have today that are all Christ-hating universities. Did you know that the foundation of most of them was actually biblical in the sense of they were based loosely off of the Bible and off and, and biblical preachers started some of those, men like Jonathan Edwards and, and other men that took over those schools. They were schools that were started in a good way in some, in some cases. Or for good things. Alexandria was the most cosmopolitan city in the world at the turn of the second century. It had a diverse population, infamous for its decadence, and boasted a huge port on the Mediterranean. The port had one of the ancient was one of the ancient wonders of the world, a five hundred foot lighthouse in the harbor. So you can imagine the type of people that were attracted to this city, right? This place. And this school. The school at Alexandria was a type of liberal arts university for the ancient world. Yep. It had many branches, including a religious one. Well, anytime you have that, trouble's coming. The religious school was founded sometime in the early years of the ministry of Christ by none other than Philo himself. an apostate Jewish Greek thinker for whom the word philosophy would spring. Philosophy was a word of which the Holy Spirit warned us to beware of. 
Here the new standard encyclopedia of 1990 says about Alexandria. As the Christian era began, the Alexandrian Jew, Philo, combining Jewish religious ideas with Greek philosophy, emphasized the mystical quality of man's relationship to God. See, he was also, which we're going to talk about, I'm going to explain to you. Origen was one of the chief mystics. And you might not understand quite what that is, but I talked about it a little bit when I talked on my broadcast probably about a year ago on mystics. And I talked about contemplative mysticism. Well, we're going to talk touch a little bit on that because Origen would be considered one of the fathers, the modern day or modern at the time, the ancient fathers of philosophy and of mysticism. All right. So it says here the mystical quality of man's relationship to God. He influenced two late second century Greek fathers of the church, Clement of Alexandria and his pupil, Origen. These two in turn headed Alexandria's catechal school or Christian school, where both Christian and pagan Greek writings were studied and where the philosophy later known as Neapolitanism evolved. Much of the mysticism of the Alexandrian school of theology was absorbed into Christian thinking. So they were spoiled with vain philosophies of men. This so-called school of theology, which married the world's rudiments with God's word, produced a Christian, in quotes, but definitely worldly school of thought. Clement was the first. His parents were party-line Roman pagans. He was supposedly led to Christ by Pantaneus, the pastor of the church at Alexandria. When Pantaneus died, Clement took the church and continued the college at Alexandria. He sought to merge the philosophies of Plato and Philo with Christ. His most dedicated student was Origen. After a period of persecutions under Severus, Clement abandoned the college and left it in the hands of Origen in 202. Origen went to work immediately collating text of the scriptures, adding and subtracting what he thought was acceptable. Now, we've heard of interpretations like that. What are those called? Well, they're not literal translations. They're dynamic equivalents, right? And there's a few other techniques that they use. But basically what he just did was he used the method of just white it out. If I don't like it, I'll just leave it out. That's what most modern perversions. He would be considered one of the fathers of modern perverted text, right? He was, the, he was also the father of modern perverted or apostate theology. Enough cannot be said to explain the damage that this man would cause later on. You just get a school and you just get teachings and you just get a school. And then what, you, what, what you're going to find later is it's all going to go south real quick. That's, that's just where it goes eventually. Origen was strange, yet his influence was great. He denied the inspiration of the book of Revelation, yet performed self-mutilation in obedience to Mark chapter 9, verse number 43. What does that mean? He castrated himself. That's what he did. He had strange ideas, which we're going to get into a little bit more. Not that, but the other part, the other strange ideas that he had. He had strange ideas about angels and denied the existence of hell. He believed in the Roman doctrine of purgatory and yet denied the existence of an eternal soul. He supposedly put together a six-column study of different versions called the Hexapla. His most influential deed was to preserve a group of Bible manuscripts which collectively have been known as the Alexandrian Text. There you go. Origen was actually excommunicated from the church at Alexandria. Afterwards, he brought his college and vast library to Caesarea in the mid-third century. Upon his death, he left both the college and the library to his brightest pupil, Pamphilius. Pamphilius, in turn, gave all the books, writings, and students' interest over to the famous Eusebius, the historian of the bishop of Caesarea. To understand the influence of the Clement, Origen, Pamphilius-Eusebius connection, 
We have to remember that Emperor Constantine asked for copies to be made of the Bible. He requested them from his friend Eusebius. Eusebius supplied the Alexandrian text for Jerome to copy for the emperor. Starting to understand? Right? So that's all we're going to cover in, in that, in the Collegiate History Workbook. Because we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about Origen and kind of break down the things that he taught and, you know, what... And the reason for this is because you've got to understand that his influence corrupted thousands. And then those teachers from schools, how many, look, what happened to the Southern Baptist Convention years ago, hundreds of years ago, that brought rise to the fundamentalist movement? The fundamentalist movement was a direct reaction to German rationalism. The Southern Baptists filled their pulpits, filled their universities with German rationalists. And those German rationalists single-handedly denied the scriptures and taught students to deny the scriptures, and they spread that out. So what, did it, what happened? Well, some, some zealous and able men rose up from the Presbyterian movement and others in the, in the defense of the scriptures and the accuracy of the Bible, and what did they do? They fought against that with the fundamentals of the faith. However, the only problem is, is that they didn't go far enough because they— the, the, the Baptists that weren't apostate joined the fundamentalist movement, got involved with the Presbyterians, which the fundamentalist movement was a Presbyterian movement, and they, they got on board with that. And what didn't they do? They, didn't, they laid down baptism, and they laid down the distinctives, and they opened communion to everybody, and they compromised their principles. Exactly. But anyway, that's uh, so Origen was that type of person. So picture having a university in Alexandria and then training peach preachers at that university and then sending those preachers out all over the world that are preaching a false gospel, that are adding things to the Bible and that are changing things. That's what Origen did. Yep. Well, the higher education, I would say, is not a pattern of Rome. I would say it's a pattern of Greek philosophy. It, it's a pattern of the Greek state. It, you know, more than it is, I would say, Roman in that sense. But Rome uses it, yeah. But it's, it's more the Greeks that, that, uh, that uh, what does the Bible say about the, uh, yep, what does the Bible say about the Jews they desire to what? And what are the Greeks? Wisdom. Right? So what is the, what is the pattern, right? The pattern was for a uh, higher education, which, for the most, there's nothing wrong with being educated, there's something wrong with vain philosophies of men. Yes, exactly. But what you're going to find when we get a little bit down the road here and not too far away, we're going to find the Donatist right here. I found Jacob found my book for me. He stole. I mean, he, he found. But uh, no, he didn't steal it. But uh, anyway, this we're, when we get into the history of the Donatist, you're going to find those old Donatist preachers that stand up and say, you know what? You keep you keep your stick at educated men. You keep your men. We don't want you filling our pulpits with those men. We have a bishop. We have a pastor. We have pastors of our churches. And we don't accept your authority. And the authority of the higher education and all those other things. You're going to find that that's, that that's going to take place, but we won't get to that yet. Origen, Origen was one of the chief fathers of Christian contemplative prayer. Now, I go into that. This is David Cloud wrote on contemplative prayer, okay? And he's, he, he compiled the history of Origen, which is one of the serious, one of the serious, one of the fathers, so to speak, of that era of contemplative prayer. But he was also, we're, the reason I'm reading from this is because there's a lot of other uh, facts that he gathers in that is going to deal with Origen's doctrines that he taught. Because... He basically taught a lot of Gnosticism and a lot of, well, philosophy. That's, that's what it is. That's where it goes eventually, right? Origen is one of the chief fathers of Christian, in parentheses, contemplative prayer, building an, on early Greek and Jewish mysticism. He says this, uh, B Bernard McGinn says this about a four volume on his four volume work on contemplative mysticism. The first great tradition of explicit mysticism came to birth when a theory of mysticism first fully laid out by Origen in the third century found institutional embodiment in the new phenomenon of 
monasticism in the fourth century. So that, that, was, his, that was his, that was who Origen was. No serious historian would try to dispute this. Contemplative prayer can be traced back to men like Origen, Clement, Jerome, and Augustine, Augustine, who were the fathers of monasticism, who laid the foundations for the creation of the apostate Roman Catholic Church. These men were laden down with heresies such as Mary veneration, sacramental salvation, infant baptism, and worse. Howard Boss says this, in their lives and teachings, we find the seed plot of almost all that arose later. In germ form appear the dogmas of purgatory, transubstantiation, priestly mediation, baptismal regeneration, and the whole sacramental system. Origen, though he endured persecution and torture for the cause of Christ under the Roman emperor Decius in 250, and though he defended Christianity against certain heretics, he rejected the faith once delivered unto the saints and taught many gross heresies. Origen founded in a school in Caesarea from which he expounded his errors far and wide through his students and his writings. Origen disbelieved the full inspiration and infallibility of the scriptures, holding that the inspired men apprehended and stated many things obscurely. Now, this is the trick. Watch it, because you can always tell when they're from the Alexandrian cult, can't you? You can always tell the spirit. Ruckman coined that term, but it's really true. That's exactly what they do. They're, they're, fr they're, they're from origin. They come from that place. He rejected the literal history of the early chapters in Genesis. Dad, remember that? Dad, My dad told me the story. He told me the story when, when he was uh, first married. I think it was to my mom, and he went into the Catholic church. And they told him that they didn't believe the first three chapters of the Bible. Is that correct? First five chapters of the Bible they didn't believe was literal. Now, where did they get that from? Where did they get that from? Origin. That's where it came from. That's where the teaching came from. He rejected the little his, literal history of the early chapters in Genesis and of Satan taking the Lord Jesus up to a high mountain and offering him the kingdoms of world of the world. Durant in the story of civilization, which is right down there, who is who is so Durant quotes Origin. Listen to this. Who is so foolish as to believe that God, like a husbandman, planted a garden in Eden and placed in it a tree of life, so that one who tasted of the fruit obtained life? Well, I'm so foolish to believe it because <laughs> God said it, you creep. Origen denied the literal creation described in Genesis chapter 1 through 2 and, literal, and the literal fall of Genesis 3. He denied the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Origen's opinion on the Trinity veered between Sibelianism and Arianism. Hey, that sounds like a bunch of guys I see on the, on the Internet all day long out there do the same thing. Isn't that right? And now you got them in the Ruckmanite camp, and they've infiltrated that camp, and they're talking about it all the time now. I got in arguments with them. You know what they told me? They said, well, I'd ne one guy told me, well, I'd never let you preach from my pulpit because you're post-trib. I said, okay but you let that guy that denies the Trinity preach in your pulpit. So you're talking a difference in doctrine of the timing of the rapture, and I don't believe in replacement theology, and I, and I believe there's a difference in Israel and the church, and I, I've made those statements known, but you're telling me a guy can deny the biblical Trinity and preach? Isn't it Sabellianism he preaches? Yeah. And he, and he preaches, and you're going to let him preach in your pulpit? Uh, that was... Um, Sluter, Andrew Sluter is his name. Slu yeah, Slither. Andrew Sluter is his name, and all these and a lot of these Ruckmanite churches are letting letting him preach for them and everything. And he literally is, and he preaches basically. Isn't it the same thing that D Dung Slinger preaches too? What? Yeah, and he doubled down on it, and people are like defending him, like there's no defense for what he's saying. It's heresy, and it's it's damnable heresy. It's wicked. 
Yeah, I mean, it's something that I would absolutely depart from and stay completely away from. Right. But this is where it comes from, right here. He denied the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, origins, opinion of the Trinity, veer between Sabellianism and Arianism. He expressly did not denied the consubstantial unity of the persons and the proper incarnation of the Godhead. Dabney said that in his works, recorded what Origen said in his works. He believed the Holy Spirit was the first creature made by the Father through the Son. He taught that Jesus is a created being and not the eternal Son of God. He held an aberrant view on the nature of Christ, which gave rise to the latter Arian heresy. That Origen believed Jesus Christ had an origin is evident from this statement. He said this. Secondly, that Jesus Christ himself, who came, was born of the Father before all creatures. After he had ministered to the Father in the creation of all things, for through him we are all, all things made. So there's, he's basically teaching that God created Christ, and then all things were created through Christ afterwards. Of course it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to. They're heretics. They never have to make sense. That's right. He taught that man can become divine as Jesus is divine. For Christians see that with Jesus... He said this, for Christians see that with Jesus, human and divine nature begin to be woven together so that by fellowship with divinity, human nature might become divine, not only in Jesus, but also in all those who believe and go on to undertake the life which Christ taught. So he's saying our flesh can become divine on this earth, in this life. This statement is grossly heretical on three accounts. Number one, it teaches that Jesus' deity is not unique, but it is a model for all men, that salvation is achieved by following Jesus' teachings, and that man can become divine like Jesus. Look, this is not the substitutionary atonement. This is not Jesus making us like him when, we shall, when he shall appear, then we shall be like. That's not what he's saying. He's saying in the flesh. It's heresy. Where does it come from? It comes from his philosophy, Philo. Comes from mystics. Origen taught baptismal regeneration and salvation by works. He said this, after these points, it is taught also that the soul, having a substance and life proper to itself, shall after its departure from this world be rewarded according to its merits. It is destined to obtain either an inheritance of eternal life and blessedness, if its deeds shall have procured this for it, or to be delivered up to eternal fire and punishment if the guilt of its crime shall have brought it down to this. He evidently had no clear conception of the Pauline doctrine of justification by faith. It's an important fact because it means that the gospel origin taught was a false gospel. And he was therefore under God's curse. Galatians 1. Verse 6 through 8. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. He believed in a form of purgatory and universalism that all men would be saved, believing that even Satan would be saved. Now let us see, he said this, now let us see what is meant by the threatening with eternal fire. It seems to be indicated by these words that every sinner kindles for himself the flame of his own fire and is not plunged into some fire which was kindled beforehand by someone else or which already existed before him. 
And when this dissolution and tearing asunder of the soul shall have been accomplished by means of the application of fire, no doubt it will afterward be solidified into a firmer structure and into a restoration of itself. Yeah. Horse hockey. Right? Well, really, what's that? Yeah, it's purgatory. He's denying the flames of hell, too. He's literally denying them. He's saying it's your own flame. Right. Right. He denied the literal fire of hell. He believed that men's souls are preexistent and that stars and planets possibly have souls. Time to go to Kolob. Here we go. Take the rocket ship. We're out of here. In regard to the sun, however, and the moon, this is what he said. In regard to the sun, however, and the moon and the stars, as to whether they are living beings or, or are without life, there is not clear tradition. I mean, you would think that he was like tripping, because none, of, because it doesn't even make sense. Right, spoil you through vain philosophies, right? He denied the bodily resurrection, claiming that the resurrection body is spherical, not material, and does not have members. He denied the tangible, physical nature of the resurrection body in clear contrast to the teachings of the scriptures. He was condemned by the Council of Constantinople on this account. Yeah. Yeah. Origen rejected the testimony of the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 23, and lived as an aesthetic. Is, is that how I said that right? Did I say it right? Yeah. He even castrated himself in his foolish zeal for the alleged superior holiness of celibacy over marriage. Yeah, that's a nut. Origen was also one of the chief fathers of the allegorical method of Bible interpretation, which turns the Bible into a nose of wax to be twisted as the reader sees fit. By the way, where do you think all these, these like allegorical Bible versions come in? These like that's what they are. They're not, they don't believe literally what the Bible says. Origen was also one of the chief fathers of the allegorical method, right? Uh, he claimed that the scriptures, he claimed that the scriptures, lost my place, sorry, have little use to those who understand them literally. <laughs> he described the literal meaning of scripture as bread and encouraged the student to go beyond this to the wine of allegor allegoricalism. Yep. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's what they are. Yeah. Whereby one can become intoxicated and transported to heavenly realms. That's the contemplative mysticism, too, part of it. Origins commentaries contained a wealth of fanciful interpretations abounding in heretical revisals of Scripture. As for Origins, or, Origins' character, he was evidently dishonest and tricky and his judgment most erratic. As a controversialist, he was wholly unscrupulous. Now, I'm not done yet. Let me, let's see here. Okay. Hang on, because I want to give you some more here a little bit. Let's see. I got past this. Not that you need a whole lot more, but. <laughs> yeah. Wait, there's more. That's right. It can, actually. Okay. Let me go to the next one. Fourth, uh, one of the things that uh, he taught was Lectio Divinia. Do you remember what that is? Yep. It involves the search for deeper meaning of Scripture. 
So it's mysticism. This refers to origin's spiritualized meaning that is beyond the literal. Origin claims the scriptures has four levels of meaning. He spoke of the letter and the spirit, the exterior and the interior, while acknowledging a historical literal meaning. He emphasized the allegorical sense. He likened the literal meaning of scripture to water, whereas the deeper allegorical meaning is the wine. Right, so you see all these people that Uh, the, he actually invented it. Lectio Divina was invented by the heretic Origen in the 3rd century. was adopted by the Roman Catholic practice in the Dark Ages. Origen is a dangerous man to follow. Among other heresies, he denied the infallible inspiration of Scripture and the literal history of the early chapters of Genesis. We talked about that. The practice of Lectio Divina was incorporated into the rules of Rome's dark monasticism. It was systemized into four steps in the 12th century by Guido II. Guido. As a Carthusian monk in the Ladder of Four Rings. It sounds like a bad episode of The Lord of the Rings. It is that dark, though. And guarantee you there was witches around. The Ladder of Four Rings or the Monk's Ladder. The four steps are reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation, which are supposed to be the means by which one could climb from earth to heaven and learn heavenly secrets. Now, you have to understand, Brother Paul, you and I have talked about this before. Roman Catholics and other people, they have different interpretations for words that we use. Like, they don't believe the same thing we do. When we say meditation, we mean thinking on the text, praying and asking God to show us things. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about om. They're talking about going off into crazy spooky land and emptying their mind. They're taught, what's that? Yes, that's what they're talking about. That's what these people are talking about. And he's the father of it. He's the one that popularized it. Well, Satan's the father of it, but he's the earthly representative of it. Probably did. Him and Guido. I don't know if I could take it serious if I met a monk named Guido. I would be losing it. Thus, Lectio Divina is intimately associated with Roman Catholicism and its false gospel. Modern Lectio Divina gurus such as Thomas Merton and Thomas Keaton following in the footsteps of ancient Catholic heretics by intertwining this practice with the heresies of Rome. Merton, or for example, associates, associates Lectio Divina with the Mass, which he describes as a living and supremely efficacious representation of Christ's sacrifice, baptismal regeneration, meriting Union with God, prayers to Mary, and salvation through works. See, this is who they are. I think that's all. Let's see. Yes. By the way, there was a group called the Desert Fathers that were the Catholic style mysticism and, and celibacy is a great part of that. The idea behind Roman celibacy requirements for priests and nuns is the doctrine that the state of celibacy is more spiritual than marriage and that the priests and the nuns are married to Christ. The Catholic Church attempts to find support for this doctrine in Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 7, but he never forbade marriage. In fact, Paul required that pastors and deacons be married men. And the needy women that are supported by the church are women that have been married. There is not a hint in the New Testament of a Catholic-style monastic system which, with an enforced celibacy. Paul identified, by the way, that's your text verse, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Those are your memorization verses, Right? The desert fathers were so zealous for this heresy that some of them castrated themselves. Origen, one of the fathers of the monastic system, was of this number. Many others abandoned wives and husbands in direct disobedience to the Bible in order to live celibate as monks and nuns. The Council of Elvira, which we're not going to, Elvira, and the Council of Carthage demanded that married bishops and priests keep away from their wives. Because they're a bunch of perverts. 
anyway, okay, so that's his on that. Let me see. I'm almost done. Almost done. Let's see. Let's see if there's anything in here of any importance. Uh, let's see. He calls him an ex uh, Orchard calls him an eccentric genius. Um, about the time that Origen went to school, the affairs of religion underwent a very considerable change. As the old pastors were removed by death, the new ones, and particularly those from the Alexandrian school, were for introducing the new doctrines and disciplines so that a mixture of Jewish, Gentile, and Christian modes formed a code of laws for religious affairs. Origen embraced eagerly this new species of doctrine, explaining the scriptures in the most licentious manner, which proved exceedingly pernicious to the interests of true religion. His symbolic views were auxiliary to his own mutilation. He advocated strongly the new system of education, though many of the pious opposed it from their convictions of its pernicious consequences in the minds of ministers. Yet Origen's influence revealed or prevailed and Platonian... Is it Platonianism, Platoism, Platonianism, and Christianity triumphed. Origen's views of the believer's baptism, we have detailed the genuine Greek words of this writer containing nothing in favor. So it says here that he wasn't really in favor of infant baptism. And, and the point that Baptists make about that is, is that as they follow the line down, they're going to show you when, ba when infant baptism came into play. Baptists, Baptists are recording, they're not, like, no one is condoning Origen saying he's a great guy. They're recording him because he was an influential guy at the time, and he still wasn't practicing infant baptism. You understand? So Baptists find their history and their enemies. That's, that's how we find it. People that say really bad things and killed us, they write it down. They love to glory in themselves. So they wrote it down. We killed those people, and here's why we did it. Boy, they were nice people, though. Good citizens, never hurt anybody. Right. They wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bend, right? So that's what they did. Now let me see if I have one more thing on origin here, and I think I'm done here. Okay, so your question, number one, who was that heretic? And name three of his heresies that he taught. So be able to name three of those heresies that he taught. If you don't have the collegiate history workbook at your house, uh, you, you ought to get it, and let us know if you don't have it. We'll, we'll figure something out with that, but that's a, it's a good work. Now, I'm using a ton of different resources, not just that, but that's a good basis of spring, to spring off of that with that. Um, let's see. Let's see if there's anything that I really want to talk about here with that. Nah, probably not. Let's see. Okay, nothing really about this that I'm done. I think I'm done pretty much with that. So uh, that gives you the history. I don't think I've left anything out there that you need to know about. But that's who Origen was. Yep. All what you would call all what you would call Orthodox Bible believers, which weren't called Baptists at the time. They were just Bible believers. But um, would have rose up. There were there were other leaders of the time that would have rose up. Let me see. Where do I have my? Oh yes, always, always in the third century. We'll talk about some, but I'll give you some of their names. Uh, well, you know. Uh, let's see. I believe the Novationist. Novation. He would have been one. Yes, yes. Uh, he well, while the Novatius were around that time, and so were the Donatists. There were there there were, the Donatists and the Novatius would have been the Baptist people of the time that would have stood up against those heresies and would have fought them. Um, then you would have believers all over the place. Uh, you know, the Novatius would have been there. They would have been one of the major groups that would have. You know, there were always, and there would be this, there would be this, the small churches that nobody ever knew about that would stand for Bible doctrine, that when Origen would teach his things, you already heard there were groups of people that 
they said, well, we're not going to. So Novatian would have been one of those in the, sec in the third century that would, would have arose. The Donatists, they were around still, I or at that time they were around. We're going to talk about them in the third and fourth century, I believe, and then on and on. But, but, uh, but the Donatists would have been around at that time. So men would rise up and combat the heresies that were there. Groups of men would. That would, be, that would be just one of the major groups at that time. The problem is we don't have a lot of record of them because, well, they killed them. So <laughs> we, just, we don't have a ton of record of them, uh, all of the men that would have been at that time. Let me see. I'll give you if there's a few other names. Here's one, Fel Felicius Mus, ordained elder of the Novatian Independent Church. He argued for the existence of the Independent Church in Rome at the Council of, Council of Carthage in 251. He lost the argument with Cyprian and the rest of the bishops from the North Africa, but his Independent Church lived. So he stayed true. The rest of them didn't. They fell under the, the line. Um, let's see. Filius. A lot of those people were... Heretics at that time. Dionysus was one that stood up. Uh, Methodius, Methodius, the bishop of Olympus in Lycia and a martyr in 311. He wrote several works against Origen, among which a treatise on the resurrection. Right? So there were men that stood up. And uh, against the, the heresy, like there always will be, but you always hear about the chief heretics. You very seldom hear about the, real, the men that, because they had the power to wield the sword. And, you know, just like you're going to find out with, with Augustine and Constantine, like you're going to find out with Constantine as we get closer to the, the existence of the Roman Catholic Church, you're going to find out that Constantine had all the power. And that's when our studies are going to get interesting, <laughs> more interesting than that, in that sense. Okay, so anyway, Constantine after. Yep, yep, after. As we continue to go down the line, uh, you'll, we'll get closer. That was the fourth century, but you, you're going to start getting, yep, yep, 313 or something like that. Yeah, that's the fourth century. So we'll start to talk about those, those people. But you're going to start to see the formation of these groups. And one man that kind of stands out with a group of people and starts to stand up, and then he plants a lot of churches or other men come that he trains up and that God preserves his church through those that followed his word and those that planted churches. You're going to see those church planters arise up and defy the Roman Catholic whore that is being developed, the state church that's being developed, and also the apostates that arise. Because every single one of those Roman Catholic doctrines are almost taught today. Almost every single one of those that Origen stood for. And he was the, he was pretty much the father of them. But do you know, do you understand where it came from? It came from a merging of Greek philosophy with Christianity. With biblical Christianity, they merged Greek philosophy. Right? So what, in turn, what do we have? What you have, well, think about it this way. In Acts chapter 17, verse number 18, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics ent encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Or some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They were there. It's the same philosophers, right? It's the same people. And different groups, but the same spirit, right? Uh, let's see. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Paul warned about, but shun profane and vain babblings. He said it again, avoiding pro Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings. An opposition of science, falsely so-called. 
from which some, having swerved, having turned aside into vain jangling. Right? So, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's what happened there. Amen? All right. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can have it and hold it in our hands. The very words of life that we believe in its inspiration, its preservation, its infallibility. And thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, thank you that we have the truth. And thank you that there were men and women that lived and died for the truth and for the sake of Christ and his cause and his book. And Lord, may we be eternally grateful for your hand in it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.